you spoke about um, paying homage to those who came before you. Absolutely. It, many people, they know you and your success um, for being down with Timberland. Yeah. And, you know, I know you were signed to Interscope, but how how did you and Timberland get put together? So here's how it went down. And I'm pretty sure that I heard, I don't, you know, there's a story about how Eminem and Dre got together and all that. I'm pretty sure I heard a different version of that story. You know what I'm saying? Like I knew Dean Geislinger. He was my A&R at, Inter at Interscope as well. He was the kid that really had spotted Eminem. He was a young kid. I think he started off as Jimmy Iovine's assistant. But he's the kid. Dean Geislinger found Eminem. You know what I'm saying? And he um, he was basically trying to like, he was his biggest cheerleader, his biggest pom-pom cat. He was trying to just get everybody to, to mess with him. But like I said, there wasn't a lot of respect for the institution of the white rapper at that time. And so it took him a minute to get some traction around that town of L.A. when he brought him out there into, in that building of Interscope, and especially with Aftermath and Dre. I, I don't think Dre was too like hyped about it at the time, um, at the initial introduction of the prospects of him you know, uh, signing Eminem. But um, as far as my story, so I go in, and I'd been signed to Interscope. Jimmy signed me himself. I would literally talk on the phone with Jimmy Ivy once a week. This is pre-Timberland. He actually tried to put me with Swiss Beats at first. Shout out to Swiss Beats. We went in. We did some decent music because he had learned from the Dre and, and Jimmy experience. He had learned. I mean, Dre and uh, Eminem experience. He had learned that, wait a minute, there's something to this now. You take the white boy, you know what I'm saying, and you... Grouping with the credible, established, respected black producer, and he stamp it. And then, you know what I'm saying? And that's like the best of both worlds, you know what I'm saying? And so you're going to get the 79% of all hip hop rap consumers at the time were white kids at, that, at this time. Like, that's what they told us when we first signed with Interscope. It says 79% of all rap music consumers, not people that listen, but people that buy it, are white kids. And so, obviously, if you have white kids that are that are ingesting it like that, you know what I'm saying? At, at a certain point, if you just if you ingest something, you ingest something, you absorb it, absorb it, you're you're studying it, you love it, sooner or later white kids gonna start doing it. That's just the way it is. And if you didn't want that to happen, then you probably should have never wanted to market it to white kids, and then you wouldn't have been riding around in Bentleys and stuff like that. So it's just the double-edged sword that comes along with it. Um, but they signed me to Interscope. He I wanted to. I grew up idolizing Organized Noise, the Dungeon Family, you know, me being from Georgia. They had just done a deal that um, with Organized Noise, with Rico Wade, Jimmy had, that di that kind of concluded and, and didn't really maximize its potential. You know what I'm saying? The deal didn't didn't uh, accomplish what they had had hoped and expected and paid and, and the money that was spent on it or whatever. So um, that, was, that situation was ending right as I was coming to Interscope. This is he hasn't even started talking to Timberland yet about a, a deal at this time, but tries to put me with Swiss Beats. We do a couple songs. It was cool. We just didn't have a chemistry. I think Swiss is Swiss didn't really culturally being from from uh, Yonkers or just New York. I'm not sure if exactly if he was from Yonkers, but um, he didn't really from the Bronx. He didn't really yeah. He's from the Bronx. That's right. He didn't really relate to. Uh, so I guess from a rhyme standpoint, he was like, man, the kid's spitting. But I, I don't think he really maybe understood culturally exactly what, what it was. You know what I'm saying? And so um, that didn't quite work out, even though it was a great time working with him. And then I was like, all right, I tried one well, by Rico, Organized Noise. So he was like, all right. He's like, you sure? I just did this deal with him. He's like, but all right, if that's what you want to do, I'm going to call Rico. And, so, and I had met Rico before. Uh, at a show in back in Athens with Cool Breeze like two years before. And uh, and kind of, like, I just always felt like that was my destiny, honestly. Like, you know what I'm saying? I felt like there was a lot of, that that was where the history was going to be made. It was me rocking with Organized Noise and, and, and uh, the Dungeon family. And um, and so I go down, I work with Rico, you know, and we, we did some cool songs, and it started a friendship and a... Uh, uh, an alliance that that endures to this day. You know what I'm saying? That's my brother. I just went to his house and watched the national championship game when Georgia played uh, TCU the other night and I had a great time. That's my brother for life. And as well as, you know, I ended up being signed to Big Boy and Purple Ribbon. And, you know, the Dungeon family is my fam. But uh, we just didn't necessarily have the chemistry at that time to come with the kind of hits that, they, that, that Jimmy was looking for that we needed to have. 
And so I remember we were, I'd done like three pretty cool records with Organized Noise and then Jimmy's like, I meet with this guy tonight. What do you think about this? He calls me, he's like, Timberland. I said, Jimmy, that's perfect. <laughs> I said, look, man. I said, So you, you knew off the Oh, rip. I knew. when he Because I knew what he was trying to do. He was trying to fish and find. He was eventually going to get to Pharrell. You know what I'm saying? And he was, but I'm not saying that it was all on the premise of me that he was going to do this, but I was a vital cog in the fact that he was about to break some producer off with some money to come in and do their thing with Interscope, but also to take this white boy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so mm -hmm. um, it, it, he goes and plays uh He's like, you want me to play, the, play him the music? I said, yes, play it for him. That's perfect, Jimmy. I'm telling you, that's perfect. I knew the Timberland sound at that time, you know what I'm saying? Like, I was like, man, I would eat on them Timberland beats. And so he um he plays it for him. Timberland didn't believe I was a white dude. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's Timberland was like, you know, when he played in my music, Timberland was like, that's what I need. I need an N-word like that. You know what I'm saying? And <laughs> and, uh, and and Jimmy was like, He's not black. He was like, what? He didn't believe it. So the next day I flew out there to L.A. They was in L.A. I was in, in Georgia. I was in Athens. And I flew out there the next day. And uh, the rest was history.